Welcome to chapter 20. This chapter is um, slightly difficult and uh, sort of long, so we're going to move fast um, today while we do this. If you um, get confused, make sure you check out the full lecture uh, video um, also on, on, on the course website. Okay, what we're going to talk about is um, the short run and, and how things change in the short run in the macro economy. So in the long run, this is not the short run, in the long run, real GDP grows about 3% per year on average. However, in the short run, the GDP goes kind of up and down around this long run trend, okay? And when the GDP goes down, it's called recessions. Really bad recessions are called depressions. And the up and down nature of the GDP is called a business cycle. So here's... Uh, the long run GDP of the United States, you can see it kind of goes up about 3% per year. The shaded bars are recessions, and you see that they're irregular and unpredictable. So even though it's called a business cycle, it's not, it's not like a cyclical process. It just kind of happens whenever. That's fact number one. Fact number two is these quantities fluctuate together. So here, instead of having the GDP, I have investment spending, I, all of these numbers right here. And you see every time a recession comes along, the, the investment spending drops, okay? So these macroeconomic variables are moving together, as well as the unemployment rate. You see that during recessions right here, that unemployment rate goes up, just like we would expect, okay? Fact number three, every time output falls, unemployment rises. Okay, so when GDP goes down, unemployment goes up. Um, really, why do, in the short run, does the GDP go up and down? Difficult to understand, really, but I'm going to show you a model um, to help explain this. It's called the ASAD, or Aggregate Demand, Aggregate Supply Model, and we're going to use it to study the fluctuations. This is different from classical economic theories, which are used to explain the long run. Okay, so to remind you about these classical economic theories, uh, we, we depend on this thing called the classical dichotomy. It's basically the separation of variables into real variables, those that are measured in quantities, and nominal variables, those that are measured in terms of money. We really only care about real quantities. Nominal quantities can change. They're just like prices. Um, they can change, but if everyone's wages go up as well, then nothing real actually changed, okay? So the idea here is that changes in the money supply can affect nominal but not real variables. That's called the neutrality of money, and it's something that we studied when we talked about the Fed uh, increasing the money supply. All right, so uh, the classical theory really works in the long run, but the fact of the matter is is that we have noticed in the short run, so we're talking just a year or two, that if you change money right now, it actually does change real variables right now in the short run. In the long run, it all goes back to where it was, but in the short run, stuff does change, okay? Changes in nominal variables can affect real variables. So basically, the classical economics idea got broken, and I'm going to explain to you the ways that in which it got to which it got broke in, in the ways in which it broke. Um, we're going to actually have to use a new model to understand the short run. It's called the ASAD model. Okay, so basically, it looks like any sort of supply and demand model we've ever seen. There's a price up here, but this is the price of all goods, the price of that shopping cart, because this is on um, the model of where the market is the entire economy. And instead of Q down here, we're going to have uh, real GDP because that's the quantity of output. All right, we have an aggregate demand, an aggregate short run aggregate supply curve. It determines an equilibrium price level and an equilibrium output, just like every supply and demand curve that you've ever seen before. Okay, the AD curve, it shows the quantity of goods and services demanded for any price level. Okay, so at P1, people want Y1 goods. At P2, people want Y2 goods, right? It decreased. It's downward sloping. Why does it slope downward? Well, the identity um, that we use to derive GDP is C plus I plus G plus NX. So as price goes up, right? We want to know what happens to uh, these variables right here, and this will kind of give us an insight to what happens to real GDP. First, we're going to assume G is fixed by government policy, and then we're going to look at what happens to C, I, and N, X. So what happens to C when P changes? Well, when P goes up, people feel less rich, um, their consumption goes down, and that makes uh, GDP go down. What about I, what happens to investment when P changes? Well, if P rises, it requires more dollars, right? So people save less, and that's also known as selling bonds, um, right? In the market for loanable funds, people take their money out of the 
market for loanable funds, that's known as selling bonds, in order to get the extra dollars that they need, drives up the interest rates, which drives down investment, right? Because investment depends negatively on interest rates. Okay, finally, what happens to the exchange rate? Well, we're gonna have to use the triple model here to understand uh, the model that we learned last chapter. If P goes up, right, we know that the interest rates rise. We just talked about that last slide. That means foreign investors desire more US bonds. That means there's a higher demand for dollars in the foreign exchange market. That means the US exchange rate appreciates. In other words, goods get more expensive in the United States. The real exchange rate appreciates. And so US exports are more expensive to people abroad and imports cheaper to US residents. It makes NX fall, okay? So all three things fall when, uh, when the price goes up. And here's the way we kind of look at it. Here is the decrease in demand due to um, the decrease in consumption. There's the decrease in demand due to the decrease in investment, the decrease in demand due to a decrease in net exports. In general, when P goes up to P2, Y falls to Y2. So why would the AD curve shift? Well, anything that changes C, I, G, or N, X, except for P, will shift the AD curve, all right? So stock market boom makes people feel richer. Their consumption rises that makes the AD curve shift to the right, just like that, all right? Um, so things that change C might be stock market boom or crash, preferences regarding the consumption saving trade-off, tax hikes or cuts, all of these things change C. Changes in investment might be firms buying new computers, expectations, or if you think that the, the future is going to be uh, better or worse off, interest rates, monetary policy, and investment tax credits or other government policies to try to increase um, investment. What might change government spending? Well, federal spending and state and local spending. What might change exports? Well, there's two things. Booms or recessions in countries that buy our exports, right? If, if Canada gets richer, experiences a boom, they're gonna use, take in more of our exports. So that's gonna change the and net exports. Also, if um, the real exchange rate changes, that will change our net exports. All right, so let's go ahead and see what's gonna happen to the AD curve in each of the following scenarios. I'm going to give you these four stories and you need to draw a separate AD curve for each of them and then see how it changes. Hit pause, do this, and then come back to me when you're done. All right, so if an investment tax credit expires, that means investment falls, AD curve shifts left. If the US exchange rate falls, that means net exports rises, right, because our exports get cheaper for people to buy, and the AD curve shifts to the right. A fall in prices uh, is going to just be a movement along the AD curve. This is kind of tricky, right? There's no shift of the curve. It's just a movement along the curve. And finally, if the state government changes sales tax with other taxes, well, sales taxes make it be easier to buy things. It's going to be cheaper to buy things, so your consumption is going to rise and your aggregate demand curve is going to shift to the right. Okay, so we talked about aggregate demand. Let's talk about aggregate supply. So this is the suppliers. These are the firms that are making it. We're going to transition from the aggregate demand, which is consumers, to firms, which is aggregate supply. Okay, and here's the part that gets really confusing. Okay, in the short run, the aggregate supply curve curves upward. In the long run, though, it's straight up and down. So there's actually two aggregate supply curves. Let's talk about why one of them is straight up and down and one of them is upward sloping. Okay, the long run, we know that uh, there is a something called money neutrality. In other words, this nominal variable cannot affect this real variable. That's what classical economics tells us. So in the long run, we know that this is true, that no matter what happens to the price, price can go up and down, the, the output is going to stay the same. And this level, which stays the same out, we're going to call it YN, or the natural rate of output. This corresponds to the natural rate of unemployment that we learned about in the unemployment chapter. Okay, It's also called the potential output or full employment output. And it's determined by labor, capital, natural resources, and the level of technology. Remember the production function that Y is equal to um, F of labor, capital, human capital, natural resources, and all of that times A, technology, right? So only these things can change the natural output amount of Y. Prices cannot change that, all right? So an increase in price, right? It does not affect any of these 
and so it does not affect yn. This is this is the classical dichotomy coming in again, right? Change in p cannot affect y because p is nominal and y is real. Okay. Um, any any event that changes any of those determinants, you know, the labor, the capital, the human resources, anything like that, will shift the long run aggregate supply. So if immigration people immigrate into the United States, it increases labor, which makes output rise, right? If there's more workers, they'll be able to produce more items. So the long run aggregate supply curve might shift to the right there. All right, so anything that changes L or the natural rate of unemployment, like immigration, baby boomers retiring, government policies reducing natural uh, unemployment rate, all of these are going to shift the um, long run aggregate supply curve. Here's another thing that could change. Change in human capital or regular K, physical capital, can change the long run aggregate supply curve. So if you have more factories or more people getting college degrees, it's going to change K or H. Um, if a factories are destroyed by a hurricane, that's going to decrease K, which is going to make the long run aggregate supply curve shift to the left. Changes in natural resources, right? If we discover new mineral deposits, reduction in the supply of imported oil, or even changing weather patterns. So these have to be long-term weather, weather patterns that affect agricultural production will all change natural resources and they'll all shift the long-run aggregate supply curve. Um, finally, changes in technology uh, will shift the long-run aggregate supply curve. Okay, so it, I put the long run aggregate supply and I put the long run, or I put the aggregate demand curve. Luckily, the aggregate demand curve doesn't have a long run version of it, right? And I determined the price level and the output in 1990. And uh, what do we know? As the economy increases in technology, it shifts the long run aggregate supply curve to the right in 2000, right? It shifts again maybe in 2010. The long run aggregate supply. Well, if you if the aggregate demand curve didn't also move, it would look like, look, this is the intersection point here. It would look like the price level is falling, and then the intersection point here would be even negative, right? But there's something else that's happening over the years. Money growth is shifting the AD curve to the right. We'll get more into this next chapter about why exactly it makes the AD curve shift to the right. But just imagine if there's more money, more dollars, green dollar bills out in the economy, people are going to buy more stuff. Consumption is going to go up, and AD curve is going to shift to the right. So just imagine that. Anyways, these things are both happening at the same time, right? And there's the 2010 version. And so basically what you have is rising prices and rising output, right? That's 2000, and here's the 2010 version. Rising prices and rising GDP. All right, let's talk about the short run aggregate supply. Remember, it's upward sloping. So this is very weird. This is saying that a nominal variable here can affect this real variable. Basically, it's saying the classical dichotomy is broken. Um, and saying that, you know, over a short period of time, one to two years, if you increase P, it does increase Y, a real variable, okay? It's saying that something's wrong with the classical dichotomy. All right, why does this matter? Well, if the long-run aggregate supply curve were vertical, excuse me, if any aggregate supply curve is vertical, if the AD curve changes, look, it doesn't actually change output. All it does is change prices. We don't technically care about prices because prices are nominal. Um, and so if the supply curve is upward sloping, like so, then uh, if my AD curve shifts, it shifts my Y up to high. You see, it shifts my Y up to high right here. And then if it, uh, if it decreases, it shifts my Y down to Y low. Okay. So with an upward sloping uh, aggregate supply curve, changes in AD do change, do go ahead and change my output. So why? Why is the SRAS upward sloping? Well, we're going to give you three theories. And in each theory, there's some problem or type of market imperfection that says, you know what? When the actual price level deviates from the price level that people expect, now it's the expected price level, this is what it is, um, then we have a change in Y. Okay, and all of these, that's kind of like the summary of these. So first of all, there's the sticky wage theory, right? If wages are sticky in the short run because of labor contracts, firms and workers set the nominal wage in the in the future based on a expected wage, right? Ex price, that's an expected price, okay? Expected prices and wages. Um, and so basically, if price level that actually occurs, that's this P, if the price level that occurs is higher than the expected prices, right? In other words, I'm able to sell goods for a higher price, but I don't have to pay my workers yet uh, more because their labor contracts haven't changed, their wages are sticky, and so production is more profitable, so I increase output and employment. And higher P causes higher Y, which means the SRAS curve slopes upward.
That's one theory. Theory number two, sticky prices. I did not make up these, these names. These are the actual names, right? Prices are sticky in the short run. Okay, remember menu costs? Um, so if, if right now firms are setting their prices based on the expected price level, PE, okay? But let's imagine that the, incre the Fed increased the money supply unexpectedly, so price is going to rise. In the short run, however, firms without menu costs can raise their prices, but firms with menu costs wait to raise their prices because it is a hassle to print new menus or whatever change uh, that whatever costs it costs them to change their prices. Um, and so their prices are low. People buy their products more, so they go ahead and increase output, um, and Y goes up in the short run. Right, so higher P makes Y go up in the short run. And finally, the third is this thing called the misperceptions theory. Basically, people get confused. Um, the price level goes up, but they don't understand that it's just the general price level of everything go up. They think that uh, when, when the price rises above the price that they expected it to be, they think that everybody just wants to buy their goods. And they think that it's their relative price is rising. Okay, they think instead of realizing that everybody just has more dollar bills because there's more dollars in the society, they think that people are trying to buy their product more, so they increase output. So that makes the SRAS curve upward sloping in the short run. So in all three theories, Y changes from YN when the real price level P is different than the expected price level PE. So we're going to put together in this formula here, where Y is the real output, YN is the natural rate of output in the long run, P is the actual price level that ends up occurring, and PE was the expected price level that people expected in the past. Now there's this uh, variable alpha which multiplies this. It's greater than zero. It measures how much Y responds to unexpected changes in P. So let's investigate how this works. Throw the formula up there. Here's the short run aggregate supply curve. There's the natural rate of output, and there's the expected price level. So you, so you can see that we're at long run equilibrium right now. Now, when the price is the, when the price rises above, see the actual price that, that occurs rises above the expected price, right? So we're up here somewhere. Then what happens? People raise their Y higher than um, the natural rate. In other words, this number is bigger than this number. So this whole term in parentheses is a positive number. So the total output right here is equal to the natural rate of output plus a, which is positive, times some positive number. So this all adds onto yn, and I get a higher level of output over here somewhere. Okay, that's how that happens for when price is greater than expected. When price is less than expected, the opposite occurs, right? Price minus PE, this whole term right here, if this is a small number, this becomes negative. Okay, so basically we have yn plus a negative number over here, that's going to make the output decrease in the short run only. So that's kind of how that formula works. The, the imperfections though, the things that cause the SRIS to curve upward sloping are temporary. Over time, sticky wages and prices become flexible, misperceptions are corrected, and we arrive at the long run, okay? In the long run, the people expect the right price, right? It's kind of like you can fool people one time, but then after, after a couple of years, they change their PE, their expected prices, to the real price level, okay? And that makes the AS curve vertical. So here you have the long run version of it. In the long run, PE equals P, right? In other words, people expect the right price. They get it right, finally, and then that is going to cause Y equal to the natural rate of output. So why would SRAS curve shift? Well, everything that shifts the LRAS, the long run aggregate supply, will also shift the short run aggregate supply plus this additional thing, expected prices. Okay, so this is really important and this is difficult. If the, if the expected price rises, workers and firms set higher wages, right? I expect the price level to rise in the future, so I'm going to demand higher wages. Well, that's going to make production be less profitable for the firms, and they're going to go ahead and uh, move their short-run aggregate supply curve to the left to decrease it. And then that will bring everything all the way back into the long-run equilibrium. So the change from short-run to long-run equilibrium is a, sh is a change in the SRAS. All right, and so then we arrive at the long run equilibrium where the expected price is equal to the real price and the output is equal to the natural output. Unemployment is at its natural rate of unemployment as well. 
So these economic fluctuations that we started this chapter uh, by thinking about are caused by events that shift the AD and the AS curves. All right, so I use these four steps. I figure out whether it shifts AD or AS, figure out if the curve shifts to the left or the right. I use the diagram to find Y and P, and then I move to the long run equilibrium. This is number four. I move to the long run equilibrium by shifting the SRAS curve again. All right, so let's say the stock market crashes. Well, it's going to decrease consumption, which is the AD curve. It's going to make it fall, so it's going to shift AD to the left. That means that both price is going to fall and output will fall. This is just the short run, though. It falls in the short run. And in the long run, then, I know that people's expectations, because the price fell here, people's PE is going to fall. What happens when PE falls? It sh changes the SRAS out here. And then I arrive back here to the natural rate. Remember, I always in the long run have to end up at the natural rate of output. And then I'm back in long run equilibrium again. So this has happened many times. Here's two examples. One, the Great Depression. Uh, the stock market fell because of the money supply fell. So stock prices fell 90%. That reduces consumption and investment, which reduces I by or Y, excuse me, real output by 27%. And the price fell by 22%, right? Just like our model would predict, Y and P both falling. And the employment unemployment rate rises drastically. Uh, on the other hand, the World War II boom was the opposite. It moved the AD curve to the right. Okay, it's because of government spending increased. So that made the Y real output increase and P increases, just like the last graph on the last slide would have predicted. Unemployment rate fell from 17 to 1%. All right, so draw the um, ASAD curves and uh, starting in long run equilibrium and then see what happens when a boom occurs in Canada. Tell me what happens to the short run, long run effects on GDP, price level, and unemployment. Okay. Click pause, do this problem, and then come back. All right, so uh, if people in Canada get richer, basically, in incomes go up in Canada, then they're going to buy more of our exports. So that means our net exports increase, which makes the AD curve shift to the right. In the short run, we have higher prices and higher Y. But then what's going to happen as we tr transition to the long run? Well, notice, yes, prices raise higher than people expected. But now people expect higher prices. So they're going to increase their PE. When PE increases, that makes the short run aggregate supply curve shift to the left. It decreases it. Okay, And that will bring us back to equilibrium, the long run equilibrium, C. Um, so we got our Y and unemployment are back at our natural levels. All right. In the 2008-2009 recession, GDP fell, unemployment rose, and the housing market caused all of this, right? So you see these are our home prices. Um, if they started at $100 in 2000, by the time we got to 2006, they were at about 210. House prices more than doubled. Now, when people when the house prices rose, they rose due to low interest rates, easier credit to get government policies to increase home ownership, and this thing called securitization of mortgages. They basically packaged mortgages up into stocks and bonds for other people to buy, right? And people thought they would never fail because house prices would never fall. Well, that turned out to be wrong. But anyway, so basically, uh, this. They, people got richer, but then the house prices crashed. Homeowners were underwater. Millions of mortgage defaults and foreclosures. All of this causes the AD curve to shift to the left, right? Because people buy less consumption and people invest less I when um, all of these problems are happening. Banks are selling foreclosed houses. It's putting the price pressure, making it go down. And then, of course, there's a bunch of unemployment due to um, the construction industry. All right, so... Um, what did what did what ended up happening? Well, these mortgage-backed securities became toxic. Uh, unemployment rose. GDP fell because the AD curve is shifting left this whole time. And what did the United States government do? Well, they reduced the federal funds rate target to near zero. Remember what the Fed funds rate is from the chapter I taught you about the Federal Reserve Bank. They repurchased these mortgage-backed securities and private loans. They, they bought the bad loans, basically. And the US Treasury injected capital into the banks in order to help, uh, help them start lending again. Okay, And finally, uh, fiscal policymakers increased government spending and reduced taxes by $800 billion. All of these things were on an effort to push the AD curve back to the right again and fix it. Okay. Um, 
Now, let's see what happens if the short run aggregate supply curve moves. The, we have been looking at an AD curve move. Let's see what happens when the SRAS moves. Okay, so if oil prices rise, this will increase costs. It will shift this short run aggregate supply curve. It will shift it to the left, okay, because it makes, um, it makes it harder to produce. So the, the suppliers produce less. That's the same thing as saying the short run aggregate supply moves to the left. Okay, so this new equilibrium has a higher price and a lower output level. We call this stagflation. Okay, it's a combination of st economic stagnation and inflation. It's called stagflation. It's really a bad situation. Okay, uh, what can be done? Well, if policymakers do nothing, we know that in the long run everything will fix itself. That's what classical economists tell us. So in the long run, we take a classical approach. Low employment will cause wages to fall. The SRAS curve will shift back down to SRAS1, and the long run equilibrium at A will occur. However, we can fix it quicker than that because we know it takes a couple years to get to the long run, to get back to A. So policymakers could try to push the AD curve up. Remember I told you a couple of ways they could do that. You can push it up um, and we'd be at point C if they decided to fix something in the short run. So that's also possible. We get y, in, y back to Y in where it needs to be and the cost is that the price level is higher than it was before. Okay, And so these there's a couple of AS curve shocks. Um, both of these shifted the AS curve to the left and you can see uh, what happened to the figures. So John Maynard Keynes, he is um, a notable economist and he said this in his article general theory of money interest employment interest and money he said hey we should not wait for the long run to fix uh things we can actually fix recessions by shifting the ad curve right because the classical people say hey it doesn't matter in the long run everything's going to come back to yn but he says this is quite funny he's like the long run we shouldn't wait in the long run we're all dead economists set themselves in too easy and useless task basically of saying oh it's all gonna the ocean will be flat in the future we'll come back to YN he was a very big proponent for trying to push the AD curve to the right to increase um, real GDP in the short run even though in the long run it would go back all by itself to the natural rate he says let's move it up there quicker there's no need that we can we should suffer uh, in the short run okay and so he kind of started this branch of thinking known as Keynesian economics all right in conclusion uh, I showed you the AD and AS curve um, the fluctuations are deviations from long run, run trends that only happen in the short run okay the models that we learned in previous chapters were all classical and they were all long run trends and this is a short run chapter uh, so we're looking at the ASAD curve and in the next chapter, we're going to build on the SAD curve to see exactly how the policymakers, the government, uh, you know, the U.S. Congress and such can push the AD curve to the right.